Of course, a rookie is starting every game here of late for the Reds, and you have to wonder if the Reds are going to have a rookie starting pitcher get the nod in every game the remainder of the season. Chris, I think that is a legitimate chance to happen. Well, I don't think there's any question about it. I mean, unless there's some move made that we don't know about uh, that they would do something other than that. I think this is a great opportunity for guys like Michael Lorenzen or or any of the other rookies that may have on the team right now or even some that may be called up later on. I'm looking forward to seeing these guys pitch uh, because you're going to have to come up here at some time or another and you get knocked around and it's not necessarily whether you get knocked around or not as a rookie. It's what you do when you get knocked down. How do you come back from it? How do you improve? And for Michael Lorenzen he's got some improving to do. Mainly in the area of throwing strikes. He's averaging more than five bases on balls for every nine innings pitched. And simply that's not going to cut it when you pitch up here in the major leagues and you've got the middle of a lineup that can take you deep. So this is something that Lorenzo knows he has to concentrate on. And I think we'll see if he begins to get better at it starting today. Hi, the Reds throw them all around the horn. Let's take a look at Mike Matheny's starting lineup today for the Cardinals. They're giving a couple of their regulars a day off today. So Carpenter, he's in there at third. Piscotti in left. Jason Hayward in right. Gritchick, the cleanup batter. Colton Wong moved up to the five spot. Brandon Moss is at first base. Yadier Molina, a day off. The same holds true for Johnny Peralta. Greg Garcia starts at short, and Michael Walker, their ace, is on the mound. At a late night here last night, you see the numbers on Lorenzen making his 16th start of the year, his 16th major league start, and his 18th major league game. Carpenter finally settles in the batter's box. Lorenzen into the windup, and here we go. Ball one outside, and this one underway. <laughs> that was not a fastball in the first pitch of the game. Carpenter. Had a big home run here last night. It came in the eighth inning off J.J. Hoover, and it tied the game at 3-3, a game the Cardinals would win on a Randall Grichik home run in the 13th inning off Dylan Axelrod, 4-3. Scott Berry calling the balls and strikes today already asked about his third pitch of the game his first borderline call of the game by Carpenter James Hoy the umpire at first Ted Barrett is a crew chief at second base and Ben May the umpire down at third. Strike three called on the outside corner. Well, that was an excellent pitch right there, although I think that Matt Carpenter was probably thinking about the preceding pitch. And that's when Lorenzen drops it right on the black. Here's Piscotti. He's played in just a little more than a dozen games since being brought up from the minor leagues. Of course, they have their regular left fielder, Matt Holliday, currently on the disabled list with a right quad strain. Holliday was injured during the Red Series. In fact, the series finale last week in St. Louis. Reds won two of three in that series over the Redbirds. Their first series win in St. Louis since 2011. They're trying to make it back to back series wins against their rivals here today. For the first time all day, the rain has actually stopped. And obviously hoping that we can, uh, at the very minimum, get five innings here today, if not a full nine. Or eight and a half would be even better. Short right, Bruce is there, and Piscotti retired. Two up, two down. We look at the Reds on defense, presented by Ford. And really the only changes from what we've seen pretty much day in and day out. Would be in center field where Jason Bourgeois gets a nod for Billy Hamilton and Tucker Barnhart will hang the signs for Michael Lorenzen. Of course, Barnhart has been playing a great deal, sharing time by and large with Brian Payne. Jason Hayward lines one into the gap in left center, but there to get it is third. They had it played that way. 
And a good start for Michael. Mows him down in order. Now Waka will take the ball when we return. Baseball on Fox Sports Ohio brought to you by Cincinnati USA Regional Tourism Network. Stay close to CincinnatiUSA.com. By Chevy, check out their award-winning lineup only at your tri-state Chevy dealer. And by Skyline Chili, feeling good, it's Skyline time. A dark, dreary day in the Queen City. Let's take a look at Brian Price's lineup presented by Meyer. Brandon Phillips and Jason Bourgeois in center field. Joey Votto will bat third today. Todd Frazier in a cleanup spot. Jay Bruce in right. Marlon Bird in left. And a latter third of Suarez, Barnhart, Lorenzen. And a tall order today facing the Cardinal Ace. The RA slightly over three, a 12-game winner in Michael Walker. Oh, you're right about that of being a tall order, nearly 6'6. Six, six. I think Michael Waka is big overhand delivery, a 12 and 4 record. And he doesn't walk very many, and he doesn't give up very many home runs. Very advanced for a 24-year-old. One and out to Brandon. Who had a nice game again here last night. Phillips had three base hits. And six at bats. He stole a base. He was out in scoring position at second base with one out in the ninth inning of a tie game and the Reds were unable to get him home. Fly ball will be handled by Gritchick in center field for out number one. We'll look at the Cardinals on defense presented by your four dealers. Gritchick flanked by Piscotti and Hayward. We talked about Couple of veterans getting days off after a late night last night. They would be Peralta the shortstop giving way to Greg Garcia. And Molina behind the plate today will be Tony Cruz. Now the batter Jason Bourgeois, 37 at bats since being activated off the disabled list with seven hits and four runs batted in. Strike one. Don't look at the number on the back and you just look out of the pitcher's mound. You would swear that you're watching Adam Wainwright from about five, seven years ago. No, you're right. Yeah, exactly right. Same body type, almost the same type of delivery. Uh, and he has picked up really where Adam Wainwright was supposed to be this year. That is at the top of their pitching staff. Wainwright lost for the season with an Achilles rupture, so he will not be back. But Walker has filled in nicely as their ace. But he does it in a different way than than Wainwright. Wainwright throws a lot of sinkers and curveballs. Walker throws a four seam fastball and a changeup as his two primary pitches. That fastball right there for strike three was 96 miles per hour. 
He really does not throw any two seamers at all. So he's a one pitch fastball pitcher. He throws a change up a lot, especially to left handers nearly 40% of the time. He throws mixes in a curveball and a little bit of a cut fastball as well. It really doesn't normally pound the bottom of the zone except with his breaking pitches. Joey Votto at 306, 19 home runs, 51 runs batted in, has been so hot since the All Star break. Now, his last couple of games, he's been walking a lot, also been striking out quite a bit. He went 0 for 3 last night with a pair of strikeouts. He did walk three times and scored a run. But I mean, sooner or later, you're not going to keep the same kind of pace that Vaught. Votto has been on since the break. Leads the major leagues in on base percentage, leads the National League in batting average, second in slugging percentage, second overall in terms of base hits. He and Jay Bruce have really carried this team offensively since the break. Kind of interesting to watch Votto in the batter's box and then Michael Walker on the mound, both trying to control the pace of pitching. Meaning after that second pitch missed, Votto never left the batter's box. He was in there. He tapped the plate a couple of times. He's ready to go. Well, Walker looked up and saw him ready to go, and he walked to the back of the mound trying to get himself ready to go. That's when Votto got out of the box. It's kind of a game within a game, and I think Votto is the type of hitter that really tries to control the pace of pitching, meaning how quickly that pitcher can come to you. Some days he takes a while. Other days he wants it fast. Very good numbers for Joey against Waka, and they're getting better. That ball drilled into right center field up against the wall, and Votto with a stand-up double with two outs here in the first inning. Now he doesn't get an often chance to bat with two out because he's oftentimes in the two-hole. But uh, Votto batting in the number three slot this afternoon gets that two out double off the right center wall. Oh, that's solid. Picture perfect. Now Frazier only three hits in 22 at bats during this homestand. He picked up his first RBI and that was on a ground out last night. Frazier had an infield hit. That was that little dribbler up the third base line that stayed fair here last night. And this is straight up in the air, and it should end the Reds' bottom of the first inning. Long has it, and it does. A hit, a run, man left. End of one, no score.
run differential. We've talked about this in the past. Take a look at the Cardinals, second only to the high-flying Toronto Blue Jays. And boy, do they do it in different ways. The Cardinals are not a huge scoring team. But their pitching is terrific. The Blue Jays are a high-scoring team. No score. We begin the second inning. Saw those top five teams on that list. Toronto, St. Louis, Houston, the Yankees, and the Dodgers. You can get to this point in the year and you're outscoring your opponents by 70 or more runs. I mean, certainly would make perfect sense in your chances of being plus 500 and very much in contention would fall in line thereafter. And that is the case for all of those teams. Man, oh man, when you've outscored your opponents like the Blue Jays have, and you're only five games over 500, their pitching has just been brutal. Kind of interesting, really, Tom, because the Cardinals have only scored five more runs on the season than have the Cincinnati Reds. So maybe offense isn't the difference there between these two ball clubs. That's a pretty good pitch by Michael Lorenzen. You know, Lorenzen looks a little different to me today. He looks a little bit more relaxed with his delivery. Doesn't seem to be overthrowing, especially early in the count, trying to save a little extra for late in the count when he wants to get the strikeout. He's had two strikeouts on the day. Pretty nifty breaking ball right there. First pitch strike to Colton Wong. Very few hitters want to waste their bat on a first pitch curveball, especially opposite hitting curveballs like a lefty hitter, righty thrower. Will tap her down to Frazier. And Lorenzen has retired the front two here in the second, the front five overall, and that'll bring up the first baseman, left handed batting Brandon Moss. Talking about the, the Blue Jays and the Cardinals and how they go about it in very different ways. The Blue Jays have scored almost 600 runs. We huh. talked about the Cardinals. They have scored 424 runs. Now, that's amazing. Now, the Cardinals have allowed 314 runs. The Blue Jays have given up nearly 470 runs. That's unbelievable. I think you're going to be a math teacher yet. No. I can just look on a piece of paper and, and where they've already done all the hard work. But man, I just cannot believe. Uh, you know, and people, when, when we have interleague games, and we'll talk to some of the announcers as there's a first base runner on a walk by Moss, and, and, and this has been a problem, as you point out, that really has plagued Lorenzen so far in his 15 major league starts, especially with two outs, a two out completely nondescript. Walk with nobody on base. But when we talk to whether it's writers or announcers or you know anybody that follows the American League on a regular basis, they just tell you you cannot believe the offense of Toronto, especially in their ballpark. The question you ask though is does really good pitching stop offense when you get down to the postseason? Because you don't see the four and five starters in postseason play. Right. You're only seeing the top of the rotation guys, and you're normally not seeing the long men or many middle men in the, in the uh, bullpen. That's why you have low scoring games postseason, and maybe what gets you there doesn't help you when you are finally there. But you know what's interesting about the American League this year is that when you look at all the top teams over there and you look at starting pitching, As bad as Toronto's pitching has been, their starting pitching ERA is better than Baltimore. It's better than Kansas City. It's better than the Yankees. 
Here's a fly ball to left field. So those are some of the teams they might be playing. Yeah. One man left. No score after an inning and a half in Great American Ballpark. And Cardinals here in Fox Sports, Ohio. I'm Jim Day. Jay Bruce set to lead off this half inning for Cincinnati. He's been well documented. The very slow start he got off to this season, first month or so. But since then, has been very good. And since the All Star break off the charts, he's a subject of our IGS bringing the energy. Post All Star stats, National League ranks 19 RBI, second in the league, top three in extra base hits, first in doubles, and when it counts, go ahead RBIs, five of them tied for second since the break. Exactly what the Reds are looking for from the Beaumont Bomber. Well, it's interesting you bring up all those great numbers by Jay Bruce, Jim Day, because our statistician Joe Luckham just tells me that Jay Bruce just would settle for one hit against the man he's facing right now. <laughs> Jay Bruce is 0 for 18 in his career against his Cardinal right-hander Michael Waka. That's the most at bats Jay has with no hits against any pitcher he has ever faced in his big league career. So it's time to change that right here and right now. Kind of interesting, really, when you try to figure out why. Other than the fact that maybe he doesn't see the ball well coming out of Walker's hand, that would be one explanation. Wait a minute now. That's in the gap. And a nice running catch by Grichik. Cardinals really like Randall Gritchick. Boy, that ball seemed to hang up there just a little bit longer than I think Jay Bruce thought. In fact, I thought that that ball may have a chance to go all the way to the wall. And Gritchick gets a good run being started and runs it right down. He's a nice player. I mean, he is putting up some very impressive numbers offensively. Real strong kid. I mean, he's going to be a fixture somewhere in that outfield. They have decisions to make as to what they're going to do. We brought up last night, they tragically lost Oscar Tavares, who died in an automobile accident involving alcohol, unfortunately, during the offseason. There's a ground ball to the first baseman, and that's the second out of the inning. And as soon as they, they heard that terrible news, the Cardinals knew they had to fill a need in the outfield. And they made the trade. Shelby Miller wound up being an all-star. They sent him to the Atlanta Braves to acquire Jason Hayward. But Hayward's here for the short term. I think all of us would be stunned if Hayward were to be a Cardinal for the long term. But you never know. We do know Gritchick will be starting somewhere next year in their outfield. Now, John Jay. 
where he figures into all this. We'll see. He's hurt right now. Two down for Eugenio Suarez. And this one out towards Hayward, and that will end the inning. One, two, three, go the Reds. We move to the third. No score. Today, Gloria Egner from Liberty Township will win this beautiful new Tundra. And you can register for your chance to win. Just stop by your Cincinnati and Northern Kentucky Toyota dealer. Very light mist continues to fall after heavy rain most of the morning and the early afternoon. Backed up our start time a little more than an hour today. Scheduled 12:35. First pitch got started just shortly after 1:40 Eastern Time. Neither team with a hit. We're set to begin the third. Neither team with a run. Garcia Waka Carpenter against Michael Lorenzen. Strike one. Popped up. Brandon will call off Suarez and that's out number one to take care of Garcia. Greg Garcia starting in short for Peralta today. Now walking six hits and 35 at bat so far this season. Pitchers are throwing strikes. Walk in the game that was a two out walk last inning to Brandon Moss. But other than that, Michael Lorenzen's been on the beam. Here's what we talked about a couple of times on and off, Tom, about the walks that the Reds have had with two outs. And the biggest offender is right here with Michael Lorenzen. He walked the batter with two outs already this ball game. And that ties him for the most in the National League along with Tyson Ross of the Padres. 
And a lot of that, Tyson Ross is a young guy, a little bit older, more experienced than Michael Lorenzo, but a lot of those two out walks can be attributed to not strategic walks, but simply your mind goes blank and you lose a little bit of concentration. Ten of those 24 have come with two outs and the base is empty. So that's even worse. You're on the verge of having a, a three batter inning and you start digging yourself a little bit of a hole. Although I thought it was interesting last night and last night's game when Seth Manus came in. He walked Botto in, in, in a tie ball game. Leading off an inning. Leading off an inning and almost like he did it on purpose in order to get to the right hander and it was Todd Frazier that helped him out by hitting into a double play to, to erase Votto. And then he walked the left hander Bruce when he came up in the same inning. Both of them on four pitches both left handed batters. And if you didn't know any better you would think well he's doing that on purpose. But why would you. But it worked. Two and two on Matt Carpenter. And now full count. Very, very limited schedule around Major League Baseball today and tonight. The Cubs came back home after leaving Pittsburgh. They lost that game last night. And they'll open a four gamer against the Giants tonight. And there's a two out walk. With nobody we else. just finished talking about it. His 25th, which gives him the most in all of the league. And it's his 11th. With two outs and nobody on. Uh, he can't afford to dwell on the negative of why I walked Matt Carpenter right here because you've got two, three, and four in the lineup coming up. Ball and a strike on Stephen Piscotti. But it's a long flight after the ball game today, flying to Phoenix, Arizona, where they will open a three game series against the Diamondbacks. Diamondbacks are starting that very odd getaway day start time in the nation's capital at 4.05 in the afternoon. They won't get into Arizona until. Very late tonight, even with a time differential. One ball, two strikes, and a check swing foul ball out of play. The New York Mets are off today. You just get the feeling, the, the whole vibe coming out of D.C. right now, that that Nationals team needs that win against Arizona today. They lose that game and they lose yet another series. Arizona really took it to them last night. And another check swing and a foul ball. As Chris brought up earlier when we were on Reds Live with Jeff Picoro and Brian Giesenslaw and talking about the playoff races in both leagues. Logic would tell you that the Nationals get people back healthy. They get just received a, a Zimmerman back. They got Worth back. They're waiting on Rendon to get back. There's a broken bat pop up. Suarez will run down, and the inning is over. No score after two and a half in Cincinnati.
copyrighted telecast is presented by authority of the Cincinnati Reds and may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form. And the accounts and descriptions of this game may not be disseminated without the express written consent of the Cincinnati Reds. Well, today, Reds fans from the Connersville Senior Center rode to the ballpark on the Fan Express to root on the Reds to try and get a win over the Cardinals today. We thank everyone who may have been a part of the Fan Express program so far this season. No score here at Great American Ballpark. Reds come to bat home half of the third inning. By the team of the run. Reds have the game's only hit. It was a two out double by Joey Votto in the first inning. Tucker a bouncer to the right for Colton Wong one away. Cheer on the Reds they'll take on the Arizona Diamondbacks that'll be a home and home quick turnaround these two clubs and they haven't played all year long the 20th through the 23rd they're here and thanks to reach magazine reach savings magazine you can catch the actions and save four for forty eight dollar ticket offer it's four. Few level tickets, $48 plus four exclusive Reds hats. Come on down to the ballpark. We'd love to have you. Log on to Reds.com. One away for Lorenzen. And it's ball one high. Now we know Lorenzen can swing the bat. Former outstanding hitter, offensive player in college, eight hits and 28 at bats as a major leaguer. Foul out of play, and it's two balls and two strikes on Lorenzen. You know, he's one of those guys, Tom, that, that looks comfortable in the, the batter's box. I mean, he's been used as a pinch hitter. He has been kept in a ball game after he was used as a pitcher in order to hit. So the Reds wouldn't burn a pinch hitter or a bench player. He's been used as a pinch runner has come around to score the walk off winning run for the Reds. And he chases the high fastball He's not the first guy against Walker to do that and come up empty. No nope, 95 miles per hour on that high gas from the Cardinal right hander Two away nobody on for Brandon Phillips. You know, and it's not only 95 mile an hour gas for Walker but that that pitch that he throws that four seamer doesn't sink. As much as it appears, meaning it almost looks like it rises. That's why he is very successful in throwing at the top of the strike zone. Some guys can't do that. If you work a lot of downward plane and don't have a lot of backspin on the ball, you can't pitch up in the zone. But he's able to do that with that high arm angle and be able to put a lot of backspin on the ball. Brandon flied out to center field his first time up. Here we go. We've talked over the years about the, the decisions that the Cardinals have had to make about signing free agents, potential free agents like Albert Pujols. Well, the Albert Pujols decision not to sign him may have benefited the Cardinals in more than just one way. They didn't spend the money on Pujols. They've been able to take that money and put it elsewhere. Brandon, a two out single. And the slot that would have been normally the the Angels slot at that time the Anaheim Angels 
ended up going to the Cardinals because the Anaheim Angels signed Albert Pujols. Well, that slot gave the Cardinals an opportunity to draft Michael Walker. So not only do you save some money in not having Pujols, but you also pick up year now 2015 ace of staff. Just three years removed from college. You know, you go back and you revisit, but we clearly, you know, took notice at the time that when the Cardinals were wrestling around with the idea as to you know, whether they were going to give Pujols that kind of financial commitment, especially the number of years, it wasn't so much the money as it was the number of years. Assigning a player to a 10 year contract. I mean, that was unheard of. Of course, that changed shortly thereafter. Reds did the same thing with Joey Votto, where they did sign Joey. But it was so interesting that you know the media did not try to you know push if you will the the DeWitt family and I'm not sure you could push them into doing anything they don't want to do they're very smart people it's the ownership group of course native Cincinnatians make their home here in fact the DeWitts you know, on a year round basis. But there wasn't a push that said, hey, you have to do this, you have to do that. The fan base wasn't crazy about them having to sign pools. We'll talk more about that when we come back. One hit, one left. We go to the fourth in a scoreless game. Wherever you are with MLB.com at bat, the number one app for live baseball at bat for your smartphone or tablet. Three innings in the books, no runs, two hits for the Reds, no runs, no hits for St. Louis. You know, we're starting to talk about the, the whole Albert Pool thing there for a second. I don't want to suggest that there weren't columnists or talk show hosts or whatever the case may be in St. Louis. People had an opinion. But I got the feeling when all that was going on, Chris, and I was there a little bit during the winter time and during that fall of doing some uh, some football games here in St. Louis, that the town understood that either way was okay. That if they brought him back, they loved Albert Pools. I think it's safe to say that as far as the first 10 years of a career, Pools was the greatest Cardinal of them all. Now. Whether his numbers would have approached would stand the man usual did who is considered to be the greatest Cardinal of them all we'll never know. But for the first 10 years of a career pools was better than just about everybody who ever played the game. That one banged into right field by Hayward and that's the first Cardinal hit of the game against Lorenzen. And that's but I think they also understood that if you don't do it we get it. I think given the fact that he was the best it put him in a unique situation of being able to demand something that has never really been out there before. I mean the length of the contract and the amount of money so the Cardinals would have been you know pioneering a new ground. Uh, 
so to say, when you talk sure. about a contract like that, especially for a non New York LA market. And I think the also misnomer is that if you wait until a player becomes a free agent and then you let him go ahead and become a free agent, the, the feeling is, well, we're not going to get anything for him. Well, the Cardinals can turn around and say, well, we got Michael Walker mm -hmm. for him. So it's not true that you're getting nothing for him. You're getting an opportunity, at least the, the way it worked in those days. I mean, there are some more complications with, you know, signing a player and so on, trading, but uh, it, it, there's something out there. And he was taken. It was not like Michael Walker was taking the, the first or second pick of that 2012 draft. He was 19th taken. So there are 18 players taken before him. And he happened to be one guy that happened to hit. Boy, did he ever. Fastball in, two balls and a strike on Gritchick. This guy is very impressive, Gritchick is. I mean, there's a few things he doesn't do great. He doesn't take a lot of walks and he strikes out, but then. The, the, just the raw numbers of, of the number of, of hits he gets and the extra base hits that he gets. Very impressive. The thing that I don't know, I don't know if you are impressed by this at all, but there is a stat where they track the, the distance of his fly balls, which kind of is just like a strength indicator. Well, he's third in baseball in that, 292 feet, or third in, or third in the National League. The other two are guys in, uh, in Arizona, including Paul Goldschmidt. So it, it shows you that in a small ballpark, he's as dangerous as anybody in the league because his normal fly ball nearly gets out of the ballpark. figure with the kind of numbers that he's beginning to put up. He's now hitting 291. Gritchick is that he ought to be in the rookie of the year conversation along with Chris Bryant, Jock Peterson, Jung Ho Gong of uh, Pittsburgh Pirates mm -hmm. having a tremendous year. But a going swing and a miss, throw down to second base, and the runner is safe. Oh my! Brandon already looking into the dugout right away. Brian Price is looking at the home plate umpire, kind of puts his hand up, says, hang on a minute. We want to take a look here. Look like a tricky little slide there by Jason Hayward. Well, this is where players can get hurt. On wet infield dirt, when they slide in head first, they can jam a shoulder because their hand will stick. Well, that's a nice slide. Boy, you're not kidding about that. That's a really nice slide. Reds are not going to challenge this call. Strike one to Colton Wall. Three strikeouts in the game for Michael Lorenz, and he's walked two. Cardinals for the first time in the game have a runner at second base. Into foul ground over near the Cardinal third base dugout and down into it. What a dandy pitch right there. I mean, coming right in on Colton Wong's hands there. Tied him all up. Kind of pitch when you make a pitch that good and you jam a guy and a ball goes up in the air, you're thinking, I, I kind of deserve an out out of this. But instead, he's got a no two count.
one two delivery pulled foul. Billy Hatcher is going to move. That ball almost got him sitting down in the dugout. So Billy's going to go ahead, walk up the steps, and stand all the way down where he can see it coming. <laughs> It's these red jerseys, but it seems like we know what kind of workout freak Michael Lorenzen is. But it just looks like every time he makes a start, he's put on another inch or two on his shoulder. Man, this guy's a big, strong cat. Plays ahead one and two on Colton Wong and walks him. Third walk given up by Lorenzen. Two on Brandon Moss coming up. Well, right now you can tweet your strongest fan photo. Use hashtag data Ohio data strong fan and you might just see yourself on an upcoming game. It's brought to you by T-Mobile. Another thing that um, seems to show up every time Lorenzen takes a ball is a, a new tattoo. He's got some more ink sporting on that left arm of his. Starting to fall into the Matt Latos sort of uh, school in that front. Not quite there yet. I wonder if Jim Day's got something on that. He was the one who told us about his original tattoo. Yeah. Ready. Hello, boys. Hello, James. Well, the original tattoo is uh, 116, which yes. is the uh, 116 click, if you will, some artist. It's based on a biblical verse, Romans 116. And he's got some other writings around it to fill that in around it. That it's all spiritually based. Mm -hmm. I don't think you could sit in the chair long enough and be still to have that done to Utah. Who? You no, no way. No, I'm not interested in any way, shape, or form in any of it. But if he likes it, God bless him. Well, I mean, just from your standpoint, being able to sit still, no, it, it wouldn't even matter. They could knock me out. Of course, I guess if you're knocked out, you probably can't stop it, right? <laughs> they must not have tattoo artists in Athens. Well, they have them, I'm sure. They didn't. They didn't when we were there. But I mean, they they, they, they certainly do now. I mean, all the that's all the rage. Mm. Swing and a miss, and Moss has gone on strikes. Now the one thing the Cardinals have is a couple of guys in this lineup that will swing and miss quite a bit. Moss is a one and Gritchick we've already talked about being another. That's just a big swing right there for two strikes. Now the catcher Tony Cruz he flied out the left field his first time up broken bat sinking liner it'll fall in a hit. And the run will score and the Cardinals are on the board on a broken bat two out single by Cruz who fills in for Yadier Molina. Makes a pitch that he probably thought when it left his hand. This is a good spot right there, but Cruz gets enough of it on there to drive it in. With two outs, very difficult to throw the runner out coming around from second base, especially somebody who can run like Jason Hayward.
Unintentional walk going to be given to Garcia in front of the pitcher. This is four walks now in the game for Lorenzo. You know, again, uh, Hayward led off the inning with the first Cardinal hit with a single. On the strike three pitch to the next batter, Grichik, he stole second base. But, you know, the long at bat is the one, again, you look back on in this inning, and, and Lorenzen's going to say, that's the one that can't happen. He had him ahead one ball and two strikes. Actually, uh, no balls and two strikes. Missed on a ball. Wong fouled away a one-two pitch. And then Lorenzen threw three straight pitches. Little, little too fine. A lot of nibbling. Walked Wong. And by not putting away a batter when you had him 0-2, one more guy comes to the plate in the inning. And in this case, that one more guy was Tony Cruz. I think we all would agree that most pitchers would rather face Tony Cruz than Colton Wong. Having said that, Chris is a former pitcher. If somebody came to you and said, tell you what, Chris, I'm going to let you start out Tony Cruz 0-0, or I'm going to give you the ball right now, and you're ahead of another batter, Colton Wong 0-2, which one are you going with? Keep the 0-2 count every day of the week, and the numbers back it up. So the Cardinals get a run and lead after a three and a half, one nothing. Now, everything you need to know to get ready for that day's game. It is Reds Live, the pregame edition. It is brought to you by Ray St. Clair Roofing. I'm Jim Day. The Reds looking for better days in the future. And throughout the rest of the season, we're going to bring you some of the numbers of some of the farmhands for the Reds, particularly those guys that came in over in those deadline deals and one of them is Cody Reed who was one of the lefties traded from the Royals in the Johnny Cueto deal he made his second start last night at double a Pensacola and look at the numbers eight innings four hits no runs walked a couple of batters struck out 12 since the trade and his two starts with the Blue Wahoos 2 and 0 record a point six ERA and in only 15 innings pitched eight strikeouts so this lefty is raw but he is good and if he keeps pitching like that we might see him at Louisville before this season so Jim Day thank you very very much he had the best start of any pitcher in the minor leagues last night I mean he simply of all teams uh, of all teams yes. yeah not just in the Reds organization I mean, he just dominated, and he's a young man that has always had a plus plus fastball and breaking ball. I mean, really good fastball, especially for a left hander, but he never has been a high strikeout pitcher. And it, this year, it seems like he's beginning to break out of that a little bit.
Joey Votto has the only Reds hit. In fact, he's the only Reds base runner in this game against Waka. Cardinals jump in front one nothing in the top of this fourth inning on the two out base hit by Tony Cruz. Reds have, all right, take that back. The Reds have two hits and two base runners. Please forgive me. Brandon Phillips had a two out single in the third inning. So Votto, a double in the first. Phillips, a two out single in the third. That's been it. No walks for Waka. He has struck out two Reds so far. Yeah, it seems like some batters go up to the plate, and before you know it, they're down 0 2. With Votto, he goes to the plate, and before you know it, he's 2 0. I mean, nearly every time. Drawn a walk to open up the fourth inning, the first issued by Walker today. Frazier popped up to the second baseman Wong ending the first inning after Votto had collected a two out double. And with Frazier really really scuffling right now. As great as he was the first half of the season. Ever since that magical night that Monday night of the all star week here in Cincinnati where he won the home run derby without a doubt the highlight. Of the Reds summer if you will. Hits have been hard to come by for Frazier, and he's quickly behind 0 and 2. I mean, it, his approach at the plate right now is screaming, I need a day off. And it's impractical to think a guy's going to sustain what he did in the first half. But sometimes you just need a, a mental day. He's never done really much against the Cardinals so far this year anyway, even with that hot first half that he had. He's a 186 versus the Cardinals. And one for 11 now in this series. But he is the kind of hitter as soon as you put your guard down, he launches one on you. Mm -hmm. One and two. Popped up down the third base line in a short left field and coming in to get it to Scotty. One out here in the Reds fourth inning. Jay Bruce coming up. You know you talk about all the young pitchers we're going to have nothing but young pitchers this weekend when the Reds go to Arizona because the Diamondbacks feel like they've got some really good young pitchers too. Reds will have Rice Iglesias up against Chase Anderson tomorrow night. Kiva Sampson against. Robbie Ray now there's a good looking young pitcher. We saw Ray in spring training mm -hmm. as he was trying to make his way to the big league club and uh, he was lights out. There's a tapper and Walker will tag out Bruce for the second out of the inning Votto advancing on to second base and then Di Sclafani against the young man who was among the best pitchers in all of Major League Baseball two years ago missed all of last season undergoing Tommy John surgery and now back again and putting up good numbers Chris is a left hander Patrick Corbin. Well so if you like young pitching you're going to get your fill of it. And we showed you earlier uh, those Diamondbacks are. Are feeling like they still have a, a puncher's chance. Mm -hmm. They're only six and a half back in the wild card. It's not like being six and a half in the wild card in the American League where there might be nine teams in front of you. And no one ever thought that coming out of spring training that they would be able to compete at all. I mean, at least for the division counter or the title or in the wild card. Well, that's why that game today, the Diamondbacks and the Nationals, I mean, sitting here in Cincinnati, it may not mean much. But when you consider that, you know, the Pirates are the wild card leader, then you have the Giants. Cubs are a half game back. 
But then you have the Nationals. If Arizona wins that game today, they are only two games behind the Washington Nationals in that wild card race. And that Diamondbacks team was among the worst teams in Major League Baseball last year. Although they've got a couple of hitters in the middle of that oh, lineup boy. that could keep you honest. Well, overall, their entire offense, top to bottom, they, they've got some guys who can hit. One two pitch. On swinging board, on to the Reds. They get a leadoff walk to Votto. He's stranded at second for the second time in the game. One nothing, St. Louis. Children's hoping you're having a great day today. Young Nick Pecoro, that's him sitting up there eating that ice cream in a black cap. His sister Allie sitting down there alongside mom Cindy. Olivia's already at the University of Kentucky, the Pecoro clan. But you know, Nick works for a company. They're all here together there with that sign, Baywack Packaging and Labeling. And you know what? A big salute to that company. And they, they don't need free pub from us, but you know, among their employees, they make it a priority to hire a majority of their employees are special needs children or special needs young adults. So that's great stuff. Glad to have their company here at the ballpark today. They whack. And did you mention happy birthday to Nick and said, oh, my gosh, that's I right. Mean, come on. My bad. I mean, the, the locks would be changed when when Jeff gets home. That's exactly if you don't right. say happy birthday That's to right. Cindy. How cool is that? That uh, there's a diving attempt by Jay Bruce and coming into second base is Carpenter. And that'll be a bloop two base hit by Matt Carpenter. Yeah, so mother and son share the same birthday. Is Nick Pecoro and his mom Cindy sharing a birthday. I assume Chris is a day when uh, when Sister Allie would feel left out today. No doubt about that. Yeah. But you know, I'm sure she has her special days around the Pecoro household.
Oh, and won the count on Piscotti, a leadoff loop double by Carpenter. Cardinals, ooh, squared around a button. That ball hit it. this ball get him he, he has completely squared his body around as the rain really starts to come down hard I got him on the arm huh I still couldn't tell there I mean why why isn't that a strike is my question I mean did he pull that bat back soon enough I think that was that would be my question if I'm Brian Price did did he pull that bat back or did was he still attempting to bunt the ball when the ball hit him. I got him flush on that left thigh. It ricocheted off and got him in the look like the upper body somewhere, but I mean that was a direct hit. That's a, ball. that's a very hard call for an umpire to make as to whether the batter is attempting or whether he pulls it back in time. And he began to pull it back, but he did it so late. I'm bringing him up on that. Of course, I'm a little biased sitting up here in a red jacket. Just a little bit. Foul ball out of play. It's nothing in two on Hayward. Two aboard. One nothing ball game. We're in the fifth, and for the first time in a while, it's starting to rain. We have plenty of it this morning. Early afternoon. If you're just joining us, our start time was moved back an hour plus today because of the rain. I think for some here, it was a nothing shy of a miracle that we ever started this game to begin with. Yet here we are in the top of the fifth inning. And the rain has come back. 0 oh, 2 to Hayward. Double play ball here. They get one, and that's all. Of course, Hayward can run, and the only chance to get a double play for Brandon is if you get the tag on the runner coming by and then fire quickly to first base. And I thought for a moment that might happen, but you see the runner, Piscotti, just, just able to get by Brandon without running out of the baseline. So Phillips gets the lead runner at least in the attempt for a double play. That's about all you can get there. All right, well now it's Grichik with runners on the corners. I'm not sure what our uh, delay is here. I guess it. Uh, well, Mike Matheny is going to ask him to take a look and make sure the throw to second was in time and that they picked up the force out there at second base. David Bell is there on the telephone. And they want to check the play. Ted Barrett is a crew chief. He is the second base umpire. And I'm wondering if Barrett is going to say, you know what, you're not going to be able to really challenge this play because that, that's that quote unquote sort of neighborhood call, I think, there, Chris. Well, unless the only way it would not be a neighborhood call is if they determined that the throw would pull the runner or pull the fielder off the yes. bag. And they call that a true throw when the throw is on the money. So where was the throw by Brandon Phillips? Well, might they say that it was high enough that Suarez had to go up and get it? I think that comes under the the neighborhood play, but we'll see how they judge that in New York. Because I mean, here's the, the the key to this whole call here now is that there is no doubt Suarez caught the ball and his foot wasn't on the base. Correct. I mean, after looking at that replay, that's quite evident. But again, 
if it is the neighborhood play in theory the way this is supposed to work is you can get away with that as long as that throw was not pulling as you brought up Chris the middle infielder in this case the shortstop the throw was not such a throw that was pulling them off of the bag and this was not one of those throws yeah they call it a true throw if the throw is a good enough throw that it doesn't pull the fielder off the bag does so does Suarez just clear the bag to get away from the runner or does he clear the bag because he has to clear the bag in order to catch the throw and be in touch with the base. It's going to be an interesting call. It will be an interesting call because it's very close and it's, it's really amazing. Well, what I've grown to appreciate this year really more than anything else is how difficult it is to umpire in real time because as we break these plays down and the more we see them and the slower that they're replayed the harder they become to call. And perhaps the other part of this thing is is actually the runner on the bag before Suarez caught the ball. That's the other part of this perhaps that they're looking at is you know we can talk about the the throw and we can talk about the neighborhood play but did the runner beat the throw to begin with here comes the uh, the verdict looks like they're getting ready to take off the headset. Out is a call at second base. And once a judgment is rendered, of course, the manager is not allowed to come back out there and ask about it or what they saw or what they heard, any of that. We've seen managers thrown out when trying to do that this year, including Brian Price. Took two minutes and 17 seconds to come to that conclusion. So what we know is the Cardinals are leading here in the fifth inning one nothing. We know they have runners at first and third with one out and we know Randall Grichik is the batter against Michael Lorenzen a rookie batting cleanup. On a first place team. Of course he's hit. At the very top in the very middle and the very bottom of the batting order in just this three game series we saw him in eighth. In game one. We saw him hit second here last night. And with off days to Molina and especially Peralta batting cleanup today. That was technically, I guess, not a Magnus challenge. But it goes, no throw through. He had such a big lead down there. He took a regular lead off. And then when Michael Lorenzo came to a stretch, he got it even a little bit more. Maybe a secondary lead is what you call that. And, and I mean, there was no way, even if Barnhart fires that ball on the money, you're going to get him. That was a crew chief review for a rules check. So Mike Matheny has not lost the ability to challenge because that was not a manager's challenge on that call. There's a lot to keep track of when they start doing the challenging and the, and the replays and reviews. I, I think we ought to have a court reporter up here. You're probably right. Well, you know, we are supposed to know, we being those that televise the game, to let fans know at home exactly what's going on. We are supposed to know whether or not before it ever begins, whether it's actually a manager's challenge or in this case an umpire's review of the rules. Mm -hmm. And uh, that part of this whole equation uh, is starting to sort of slip through the cracks and I know it's something that Major League Baseball will look at because they've been for a sport that was so close minded about you know uh, trying to think outside the box on a number of topics for a long long time that has changed dramatically in recent years especially as it pertains to this review process doesn't look like they want to give. Gritchick much to hit. Three balls and a strike. Well, even less 
now because there's a base open at first. Three and one on Randall Grichik. Boy, and then you come with a fastball that's a good location. But the guy looking for a 3 1 fastball and he jumps on it and pulls it foul. So what do you do now? Three and two. Well, he struck him out twice, both on fastballs, and if I recall, they're up in the zone. Oh boy, had him struck out on a all speed pitch there. Got him swinging on the breaking ball. That ball bounced seemingly in front of home plate. How about that? Only two out of seven pitches that Lorenzen threw in this entire at bat to Randall Gritchick were in the strike zone had he not swung. Alrighty, here's Colton Wong. He bounced to third in the second inning, drew a walk in the fourth inning. That was after Lorenzen jumped in front of him at no balls and two strikes. And a base hit on the very first pitch will knock in a pair and the Cardinals lead 3-0. Two out RBIs, they taste so sweet when you're the ones driving them in, but they hurt so much when you're the ones giving them up. Uh, Jeff Pico out for a quick visit. Think Jeff Pico in his wildest dreams when he took over this first opportunity to be a major league pitching coach. I mean, just think back a year and a half ago when Jeff Pico shows up in spring training. He has Johnny Cueto, Matt Latos, Homer <laughs> Bailey, Mike Leake, and Alfredo Simon in his starting rotation. Or actually, the year before that, Alfredo wasn't even in the rotation, right? Mm -hmm. Trying to think who the fifth guy was to yo. Uh, and Bronson Arroyo. Huh. Arroyo, Bailey, Leak, Cueto, Latos. So he really had more pitching coaches than pitchers. If you consider guys like Cueto and Arroyo. No question. And Leak for that and matter. Leak, sure. See so pitches per inning. Lorenzen averaging over 17. He's more than that here in this inning, but the. And, and, and then a year later, you have those same guys except for Arroyo plug in Alfredo Simon. And now here we are halfway through the following year. And you're working with exclusively an all rookie rotation. Man. In the blink of an eye. One oh pitch. Brandon Moss fouls it back out of play. A ball and a strike. Burke Badenhop up and throwing in the Reds bullpen. The pitcher spot is due up third when the Reds hit in the bottom of the fifth inning. It's been a long top of the fifth. Started with a double, bloop double. And Scotty hit with a pitch. Runner goes, throw to second base, and the runner is out at second base. That's an area where Wong is just not getting better. Because he can really run. Three nothing after four and a half.
convince St. Brew took only seconds to destroy a legend. Saturday, watch two of the sport's most ferocious heavyweights collide on UFC Fight Night with coverage beginning at 10 Eastern only on Fox Sports 1 and streaming live on Fox Sports Go. I'm Jim Day. Cardinals now with a 3 0 lead, and we're updating you on some of the young farmhands and some of the new arms in the red system. And let's talk about Kerry Maya. He was the centerpiece in that Mike Leak deal coming over from the Giants organization, pitching in high A ball for Daytona. Last night, five innings pitched, three hits, just one run. He did walk four batters, struck out four, and gave up a home run. But this guy, again, another raw piece. A guy that the Reds have high hopes for. Some say that perhaps he's a back end of the bullpen guy in the future. Others say they look at him as a starter. The Reds looking at him as a starter right now. And a terrific start last night for Daytona. So Jim Day bringing you up to speed on everything going on up and down the Reds minor league system and some of the players just recently acquired in the trades involving Johnny Cueto and Mike Leak. Cueto lost last night. He only allowed two runs in seven innings. But he lost to the Tigers. And he lost to a young man, Boyd, who was making his Tigers debut after coming over in the David Price trade from the Blue Jays. I like the tweet that Joel Luckup sent out last night after that ball game that Johnny Cueto feels quite at home. He's had, you know, no run support and a blown save already since joining the Royals. That's exactly right. His first start, he left with a lead. And the Royals don't give up many. The bullpen they have. Three balls and two strikes. Well, they got a wild one going on today in Philly. Bottom of the sixth inning. Nine to six. Dodgers over the fighting Phils. They're in the third inning in Milwaukee. Four nothing Brewers over the Padres. Here's a base hit in the center field by Eugenio Suarez. There are only three other games in the National League tonight. Two of them involving contenders. Arizona and Washington will start a little less than an hour. And I'll tell you what, man, that's an interesting series. It starts tonight at Wrigley Field in Chicago. A half game separates the Cubs and the Giants from that second wild card spot. And it might only be August the 6th. But when you're playing a team that you're duking it out with and you're going toe to toe four straight games, it's a pretty important series for both the Giants and the Cubbies. Where you see such a difference in the Cubs being able to play more night games now. You know, back when I was announcing their games in the early 1990s, and they were only allowed to play X number of night games per year, and you know, it seemed like you never had them. I mean, for all intents and purposes, it wasn't enough even to to scratch the surface of feeling like you ever caught up in any kind of consistency as far as the schedule is concerned. But they play a late game last night. On the road in Pittsburgh. You know, for years and years and years they would fly home and then have to play a 120 game today at Wrigley Field. Instead, they come back home and they team up at 7 o'clock at night. You stay on a schedule, you've been on the entire week while you were on the road playing in Pittsburgh. Now they'll play a day game tomorrow. I don't think they're allowed to play Friday night games there yet. That's a big difference. Two and two to count on Tucker Barnhart. Suarez getting the third Reds hit of the game. That's fouled away again. You know, of course, uh, some of those old timers are saying, give me a break. I mean, even the number of games they were allowed to play in the early 90s. It's funny, and, you know, one of my partners all those years, God rest his soul, with the Cubs was a Hall of Famer, Ron Santo, great third baseman. And those were the days before free agency. So teams that came up together stayed together. 
And you know, so many of those Cubs became such close, lifelong friends. Ernie Banks and Billy Williams and Glenn Beckard and Randy Hunley and right on down the line. This should be a double play ball. And safe as a call at first. It's good clean slide by Suarez and may have taken a little bit off the throw of Garcia to the covering pitcher at first base. It has all the makings of a double play except that it just takes a little bit of extra time there. The throw is low and Garcia makes certain he gets that runner at second base before he fires it. Kind of a slow and deliberate turn down there. And now uh, Walker requesting a little bit of uh, Handy work around the mound trying to drive things up a little bit. Brown's crew all over it. I mean, finish that thought, you know, real quick about the Cubs guys here. You know, in 1969, the Cubs had one of the truly great collapses in the history of Major League Baseball, where the Miracle Mets came back and won the division, ultimately won the World Series, the Miracle Mets that year. But the Cubs owned that division the entire year, and then all of a sudden the Cardinals and the Mets got hot. Cubs wound up finishing third. And I mean, they just completely fell apart. And by all accounts, they had the best team. But Ron Santo, and again, God bless him in so many ways, because he was such a great guy. You know, you'd ask him, did, did playing exclusively day baseball have anything to do with wearing you guys down? Day baseball at home and the hot temperatures every day during the summer. No, not a chance. Then you'd go ask his teammates, Hundley and Beckert and Williams and Banks and Beckert, and they'd say, are you kidding me? By the time we hit September every year, we were worn out. How would you not be, right? I would think so, yeah. And I think also the inconsistency in starting times has never been a, a player's friend. I mean, everybody likes to be on the schedule. Nice little quick patch up job by the Reds grounds crew. Boy, they have worked overtime this year. Ooh. Walker seems to like it. I mean, there's a little bit of a miss that it's been coming down really since since the rain stopped and allowed the game to get going. There wasn't much going on at all at the start of the game. They thought there'd be a window with no rain. It really hasn't been rain, but this is like playing a game next to Niagara Falls. Just like a little bit just wet all day long. Do you think they have little league fields next to Niagara Falls? If they do, they they have Cortex uniforms. <laughs> they look like Jim Day. <laughs> Jim? The mist has been pretty steady and it's now picked up. And the wind, the way it's blowing, guys, it's blowing that mist right at the hitter. So the hitters are having trouble at the plate because it's sometimes a gust of wind will just put it right in their face. How are you doing, by the way, down there? You know, you, normally you pack up that uh, that rain gear, the, the heavier rain gear, but today it is cool enough where if you've broken that out, I can't tell from up here. I have one rain gear, one. Oh, I thought you had more than that. Oh, no, I've got one. And it is for April. It is for July, August. It is for any temperatures, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> You're saying it's versatile. I was the only positive thing I can say is it is cool today. It's not hot. But the now, is that the uh, is that the company issued rain gear? It is government issued. Isn't yes. that uh, isn't that some kind of fancy uh, maker of that? Who is that? You know, I'd have to look that up. I, no, that has some kind of fancy. I, I don't know it if does. it's an LL Bean or a. I don't think it's LL Bean. Uh, it's, it's something on the like back, that, so I'd have to take it off to. Uh, I'll get back to you on All that. right. It's something like that. Yeah. Knowing you, they went to like Vineyard Vines or something like that. <laughs> That'd be more your. We're going to miss. And Schumacher, the pinch hitter, gone on strikes. Four strike out of the game from Michael Walker. You know, as close as you are, Jim, with some of those players, and especially the guy coming to the plate right now. But I mean, not only Brandon, but Joey Votto, 
uh, Homer Bailey, among others. I would think that you could get some of those guys to sort of to pitch in to buy you some, uh, to borrow Chris's words, some, some more versatile rain gear. Listen, these guys tried to trade me at the trade deadline for one of the <laughs> female sideline reporters. So I, I don't think so. <laughs> That's a true story. They wanted to trade me. For anybody in particular that we know, I mean, like uh, Aaron Andrews or somebody like that, did they say? I do not know the young lady's name, but they wanted to trade me to San Diego for whoever does. Oh, but she does a great there. job. I'm drawing a blank on her name. She really does a good job. But she's not Jim Day. I wouldn't trade you, big boy. Well, you're our, you're one of our our cornerstone franchise players. You're not going anywhere. Well, they said there was a holdup in the dugout one day, and uh, Todd Frazier spoke spoke up and say, "I will throw in the cash considerations." If San Diego would reconsider. That is uh, Chris Budden. She is a very sharp young lady. Does a lot of college football uh, work for Fox during the uh, football season. But uh, no way I'm making that deal. No chance. In the right field, it'll be handled by Hayward, and the inning is over. One hit, one left. We played five. Three nothing, St. Louis. Look at our Honda game summary. It was Lorenzen v. Walker when we got started. It was a broken bat, two out single by Cruz in the fourth inning that made it 1 0 St. Louis. They weren't sliding in headlong just in front of the tag. And then along with two on and two out. A base hit on the first pitch and his at bat in the fifth to make it a 3 0 game. And Walker has been Waka. He's only allowed three hits. He struck out four, walked only one batter. He's a Cardinal lace in the absence of the injured Adam Wainwright. For getaway days, Chris, are always so tough. I have my, my pumpkin pie sitting next to me up here in the booth. Little LMA Brenneman, and you always have to say goodbye when you go on these road trips. Well, she'd probably like to accompany you again. I mean, after all, you guys just got back from the West Coast. I mm -hmm. still vacation out in Coronado. The Reds will be heading to San That's Diego right. on the second leg of their three-city road trip. And I saw so pictures Lella of May was born in uh, in Arizona, as was her brother. They were out there. Grandpa, her other grandpa lives out there. They were carving up some waves out there in San Diego. I saw. She was. Hey, well, man. Little surfer girl. Beach Boys made a song about her. They didn't even know it. 30 years, 40 <laughs> years before. You're quite a lucky man. Amen. All right, Burke Badenhop to face Brandon Moss here in the top half of the sixth inning.
Tony Cruz and Greg Garcia to follow. The pitcher would be due up fourth. We talked about, we showed you the, the numbers last night, but for those of you that may have missed it, you know, this turnaround for, for Baden Hop has really been a nice story. And for a guy who came over and the Reds had, had big expectations for him, brought him in as a free agent, thought he'd be a guy that, you know, could work the seventh or the eighth inning and getting the ball ultimately to a role as Chapman. And it didn't work out that way. I mean, it was ugly in the entire month of April, and he would be the first guy to tell you that. But now all of a sudden, he's pitched better than a month's worth of games over the last three months. And has an ERA that starts with the number one. Well, you also have to figure going forward that he will be more important as the season goes along because the more rookies that you start in your rotation, it would stand the reason that you would anticipate using more middle relievers as the Reds have had to do today here in the sixth inning. I mean, when you had a staff of, you know, Cueto and Leak and Bailey and Arroyo. You know those guys are going deep into ball games and they were missing very many starts. So in those games middle relievers were like the Maytag repairman. They're just sitting out there waiting. Mm -hmm. And it's usually only the late guys where they were getting the call. A little different when you're running a lot of youngsters out there in the rotation. Bourgeois backed up short of the track makes a running catch to retire Cruz for the second out here in the St. Louis six inning Cardinals with a three nothing lead. Lorenzen goes five. Allows three runs all earned. He walked four, one intentionally. And struck out five. Cardinals had four base hits against him in his five innings on the hill. Coming in a few paces to get the pop off by Garcia. That's a seven pitch inning for Mr. Badenhoff. Well done. Reds need to get to work. Top of the order coming up, down by three. Fox Sports Ohio with Reds Live, the post game edition. Stick around with us after the game. It's brought to you by Performance Kings Honda. I'm Jim Day, continuing to update you on some of those players that came over in those deadline deals. And also coming from the Giants organization was Adam Duvall, the Louisville product, who is now playing for the Louisville Bats. Home run last night, and in four games with the Bats. 333 average and three home runs in those four games. He's an infielder outfielder. They would like to convert him full time to a left field position. He's a guy that's in his mid 20s but certainly has some pop. 
and perhaps in September we will see him and might be a piece off the bench next year. Adam Duvall, hailing from Louisville, now getting it done for the bats. You never know what next year may bring for Mr. Duvall. In fact, you never know what this year may bring for Adam Duvall. We might see him in the major league club this season. I wouldn't doubt it. I, I think that you've got a lot of guys right there at the top of the food chain and a call away. But you have to create room for them in order to do that. So that, that means either releasing a player, trading a player, or you have an injury. Or you wait till the rosters expand in September and you see him then. Oh, I imagine you're going to see uh, quite a few call ups this year. I think fans would probably like to see that too. Sure. Bourgeois, two hopper down to the third baseman. Carpenter throws Jason out, one away. This Waka, man, it is this guy. You know, pretty much every night, Chris, you're sitting up here and, and talking about some of the growing pains that, that the typical young pitcher, I mean, 99.9% .9 of them, are going to experience the roller coaster, the ups and downs, perfectly natural, including guys that have already been inducted into the Hall of Fame. This guy is a different cat altogether. I mean, since the day they brought him to the big leagues, they brought him up in 2013. He became the National League Championship Series most valuable player. And that was one year out of college. He attained that because he was drafted in 2012 and 13. He's the he's the MVP of that series. I mean that's really unheard of. I mean of course the Reds have lived through that with Mike Lee coming right out of Arizona State to the major leagues. So you do have incidences where you know players make that transition, but it's not very often. And not only very often that it happens in the regular season, it's extremely rare that it happens like mm -hmm. it did for Walk in the postseason. Yeah. I mean. It, to that year he was almost unhittable in his starts in the National League Championship Series. I mean he allowed like three hits and 90 something at bat something absurd during that uh, that postseason. There's ball four in the division series he started one game he went seven and a third innings he allowed one hit. Struck out nine, allowed one run. In two starts, both of them beating Clayton Kershaw, by the way, in 13. 13 and two thirds innings, seven hits, 13 strikeouts, two walks. And did not allow a single run in 13 and two thirds innings. Now, in the World Series, didn't go as well. He allowed eight runs in nine and two thirds innings. That's when they were. They were just kicked around by the Boston Red Sox. But in that LCS and division series, this kid was something else. Well, he's not without some blemishes. In fact, until he pitched his last game against the Colorado Rockies, about seven innings of four hit shutout baseball, he had three games in a row there where he didn't pitch well at all. And he worked hard down in the bullpen. They say he improved his breaking ball a little bit. And he's pitched very well his last time out. He's working on a shot out of here again today. But I've always liked the way, he, and, and maybe it's obvious because the guy here goes right from college almost to the postseason. I mean, his mound presence has always been such that he never really looked like a rookie. A Texan, right? Yes, he is. Yeah, there's something about Texas A&M. Something about those Texans. Well, you know, there's something about having a changeup like this, too. Yeah. I mean, same arm angle. And it's he it throws it hard as far as the miles per hour. I mean, his changeup is almost 88 miles an hour. That's the same as a roll of Shabbat. There's a curveball, a rare curve that he throws in there. But he throws four pitches, and if you talk to scouts and you rate the pitches, every one of his pitches is a plus pitch. Plus curveball you saw right there. He's got a little cutter that he uses, but primarily fastball and changeup. A 
harder rain, a steadier rain falling now with one out and one on here in the red sixth inning. Lifted to the right side in fair territory. Long will give way in fair ground to Hayward. Two outs. Dave Bruce coming up. We're getting right on that border of uh, you wonder how long they play through this. Well, there's beginning to look like they're standing water out there towards the second base bag and where the second baseman normally plays here and here it's really wet. Cardinals are not complaining. Which we've uh, played almost six full innings, so theoretically we have a completed game if it comes to that. Well, I, from the travel standpoint, too, the Cardinals go to Pittsburgh, which is about a 45 minute flight. The Reds are end up in going to Arizona, which is about a four hour flight. Cardinals going to Milwaukee. Oh, Milwaukee. 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 A little more than an hour. Then. I only know that uh, because I saw it. Well, what a pitch up pitching matchup tomorrow night on tap at Dodger Stadium in Los Angeles. Garrett Cole against Clayton Kershaw tomorrow night. Well, Cole has uh, what over half his losses to the Reds so far this year. Mm -hmm. Even though he's, he's throwing the ball really well. Reds are the only team that he really hasn't figured out. Kershaw's a, a, one of those Texas pitchers. Cole is from out, I think it's like Newport Beach or yep. somewhere, isn't he? Reds will be in Los Angeles on the third city of his coming road trip. And Kershaw grew up, I believe, just outside of Dallas. Swing and a miss. We go to the seventh. Cardinals in front, three nothing. when they take on the Diamondbacks and save with a four for forty eight dollar ticket offer plus as part of Super Saturdays the first thirty thousand fans will receive a replica Tony Perez statue it's presented by La Rosa's for tickets to Tony Perez Day on August 22nd call five one three three eight one Reds visit select Kroger locations or Reds.com slash tickets and doggy it's the next one to have a statue outside of GABP well deserved and we cannot wait for that to happen. Well it's not like they're running out of room and, and Chris I would think uh, obviously you know look. We know who's the one that you want to have out there. Sooner or later. And in the not too distant future, you're going to have to start thinking about uh, Barry Larkin. Played his whole career as a Red. Hall of Famer. Well, the good news is, and you're right about that, there is a lot of room. 
And the statues that are there seem to be magnets for people that want to take photographs and have kids hanging around them. And it, it, it's, it's a great addition to the area. Now, let me throw something out there at you. The ballpark, of course, they got restrictions as to what you can erect. And, and if you wanted a statue of Pete, right. you couldn't That's do it. That's the one I was talking about. But across the street, it's not MLB territory there, is it? What would what would stop someone from doing their own thing over there? Mm -hmm. I don't know if they have control of the sidewalk or would have to make a, a replace for it or not. But some entrepreneur might think that would be a, a little attraction. Oh, I you would. did it right. Did you? Uh... Copyright that idea or patent that idea? Or I did not, and the idea is completely free. And oftentimes, my ideas are worth what you pay for. You know, it's funny we bring that up. Did, did you read the story the other day where Urban Meyer, Ohio State University, actually put a patent on some of the urban blank, like urban nose? Those were T-shirts that were going all around the entire country, and Ohio State actually got a patent. On Urban Meyer's name. Of course, he was on board with the whole thing, but I, I don't know if I've I, I, I read an article that, that other places have done that. I had never heard of that before. Sure, sure. It, it's like the life is good saying. Sure. You know, but I'm not surprised on two counts there. Number one, that I did not see the article, but you did, <laughs> and that Ohio State decided to do that. <laughs> I, mean, I, I try, you know what, unlike you, and I know you have to prepare for the football season, but I'm, I'm a one season, one sport guy. So when baseball season's over, sure. ask me about college and NFL, I'll tell you what I know, which isn't much, but I'll be a little bit more up on it by then. Well, I, that was one of the few articles I wasn't actually out hunting around for, because I'm having to do a lot of that right now in preparation of the football season, but that was one that uh, just sort of caught my eye flipping through the uh, newspaper and... I was like, wow, never heard of that before. Meanwhile, a little Michael Jackson music going on. Some of those out there dancing around. Shake your body down to the ground. We're talking about Pete Rose, and one of the Reds franchise four. How about this quartet? Brock Gibson Hornsby Musial. I, I got to be honest with you, Chris. I, I mean, it would be hard to argue with any of those guys. I don't know how you could put up any argument for any of them. But how in the world is Albert Pools not a Cardinal franchise? For well, he, you know, it isn't it a little bit more difficult though for trying to select select a franchise for when you have. The length of the time a ball club has been in a city like the Cardinals and before them, I guess the Browns would probably qualify, right? But and Cincinnati compared to, say, you know, Seattle or San Diego or Colorado or Miami when they just have come in the league, you know, just a couple of decades ago. So I think the Cardinals ought to have room for, you know, five or six and the Reds ought to have room for ten. Well, this has been a mini delay in and of itself here as the grounds crew is doing all it can. And, well, they just do such a great job. Chris talked about it earlier. With all the rain we've had this winter, it's just the demands on them, the hours they put in have just been extraordinary. And they've been more than up to every challenge so far this season. And after all that time waiting, when the umpire says play ball, Waka walks back to the on-deck circle. Pedro Villarreal will come on and pitch, taking over for Badenhop, who worked a 1 2 3 6. We're in the seventh, where the Cardinals have just a 3 0 lead, very much a ball game.
know, for what they've asked Pedro to do this year, he's done a good job. Well, I think he finally got over the psychology of being sent down, brought back up, sent back down, brought up, not being pitched, sent back down again, and, and just realizing that, you know, this might be where he fits in on a major league roster as kind of a swing man. Possible, you know, emergency start from time to time. Possible long man, a guy that used used in, in extra inning ball games, kind of a utility player slash, you know, pitcher. You just can't let that kind of thing when you're being sent back and forth affect you mentally to think well they don't like me and that's why they're sending me down. One and two on Waka. Now that said you know it's always you know if there are 12 pitchers or 13 pitchers on the pitching staff it's always that 12 to 13 guy that the team is most likely to try to replace from year to year. So you come to spring training and you've got to battle your tail off just to keep that spot because there are you know 15 other invitees that want your job and they're all pretty good. Pedro trying to put Waka away after getting ahead a couple of strikes now two balls and two strikes. We're in the top of the seventh inning. Walk a pair of ground outs to Brandon Phillips today. And gone swinging to begin the seventh is Michael Waka. Well, the popular Bark in the Park is coming back, presented by Ives and Kroger. Purchase your Bark in the Park ticket package and bring your best furry friend to the ballpark for a special on field parade and more hurry spots. They always go so quickly. Two more of them left one against the Dodgers, the other against the Mets in September. Visit Reds.com slash dog day. You and your bride Beth were part of the the calendar that came out with your pups. We didn't get our picture in. I, I messed that thing up, but you guys have a good one on there. I can't call it a good one. It is a good one. I saw it today. It's uh, three of the three of the four pretty good picture of. But you know, hey, I love our little puppies. Trying to make bubbles a, a media star already during Bark in the Park night. Can't bring Rusty around. Rusty's a neighborhood bully. All five pounds of her. I mean, they, they, this is really good stuff. Featured in the month of April. It, does that have any significance to no. you or Beth or, or the bubbles? Or? No. No. What's the other one's name? Rusty. Rusty. No significance to Rusty? Birthday for Rusty there? I have to check that out, but it, it, <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> Let me check her birth certificate. <laughs> right. <laughs> So but, I mean, you, you, but you give them birthdays, right? I mean, you know, like like our daughter Ella, you know, she she knows the dog's birthday. So I mean, we, we like celebrate it. We have you know Ella and, uh, and Luke, and but our dogs uh, Penny and Stella. I mean, we'll, we'll randomly change that year to year, mind you, but we know the month. We think, kind of. <laughs> well, at least me. <laughs> It's a, a nice, really nice picture. Right Reds there. do a nice job in putting that together. And, uh, I love the park and the park nights. Where is this picture taken, by the way? I don't know how good this camera is right here that we have. Probably a cell phone camera. Oh, don't see if, let me let me see if we can see this here. I don't know if this camera in the booth can see this shot right here. Doubtful. Can't tell. Okay. That's too bad. Let's see if we zoom in on this baby. Can we see that? All right, let's take a look at this. We think we have it here. All right, now, there it is. My daughter Ella's here hanging out in the booth, but there's uh, Chris and Beth and Bubbles and Rusty. 
Very nice. Where's that picture taken, by the way? That's a beautiful shot. That uh, is taken in North Carolina. We had the uh, the Fort Maggie Valley Valley? weekend off. No, over in uh, the Banner Elk area. Beautiful country. Hope to get you down there one of these days. You know, I think Maggie Valley's more my style. <laughs> Here's a 2 2. And a line drive into right center field to base hit. My ball scalded by Piscotti. Bruce sliding to cut it off. He does cut it off, but it's still a double. Uh, you can't let the Cardinals have much more. Even though their bullpen may be a little bit beleaguered after last night's game, they have a way to shorten ball games with their effective bullpen. It's a pretty nice swing by Piscotti. They've been trying to pitch him down in a way the entire series, but that ball pretty much split the plate. All right, so here's Hayward, one of three, is lined to left, singled, stole the base, scored a run, reached on a fielder's choice, stole another base, and scored again on the two out, two runs single in the fifth to make it our current 3 0 score off the bat of Colton Wong. It's a big out right here indeed. We'll see if Villarreal can get it. The 1 0 to Hayward. Broken bat. He'll go get another one. One ball and one strike on Hayward. Fastball right down the middle that he takes for strike two. Two strikes on the Cardinal right fielder, runner at second, and well, it looked like Scott Berry was ready to ring him up, but off the inside edge, two balls, two strikes. Only four games in the American League today or tonight, three tonight. One going on, Kansas City and Detroit wrapping up that series, rubber game of that three game set. 6 6 score in the eighth inning. I don't know if there's a, a, a more clear cut example of a guy who is without a doubt a team's single most valuable player in a season than the Detroit Tigers and Miguel Cabrera. Mm -hmm. It's not to say they haven't had other areas that have let them down because they certainly have, but you know, they were resting atop or near the top that American League Central the entire year until Cabrera went down injured. And ever since then, the wheels have fallen off for the Tigers. I mean, can there possibly be one player who's more valuable to his team than that guy? Well, we don't really get to play the Tigers very much, Tom, but seeing him play a couple of series, he's clearly the best hitter I've seen this year. And, and he has been for a long time. Now, when Albert Pujols was playing with the Cardinals, yep. there's, a, there's a guy in the same category caliber the guy can simply mash hard hit ball but right in Suarez a scoreless inning of work by Villarreal they stand and stretch Reds are down three nothing
Doubleheader starting with the Dodgers taking on the Pirates in a key game for both teams. Then at 7 Eastern, the National League Central leading Cardinals battle the Brewers in a game you can only see on Fox Sports 1. Coverage begins at 3.30 Eastern only on Fox Sports 1 and streaming live on Fox Sports Go. We would highly encourage you to check out the Reds and the Diamondbacks as the Reds begin a 10-game road trip. And you will see one of the best hitters in the game and Paul Goldschmidt leading the league in average 339 second and runs driven in. He is a force in the middle of that lineup. And as the boy said earlier, if you like young pitching, you will see a lot of promising arms in this series. Rysel Iglesias and Chase Anderson tomorrow night. Kiva Sampson will make a second red start against a very promising lefty, Robbie Ray. And then DeSclafani versus Corbin. We are on the air for all three games in Phoenix. Here in the home of the Reds, Fox Sports Ohio. As we go on a long and long and trip. Ten games in 11 days. Say, I'm really looking forward to seeing Goldschmidt. Uh, you know, as you just mentioned, uh, the league leader in batting average, second in runs batted in. He's two behind Nolan Arenado of the Colorado Rockies. And he has the fourth most home runs. Now, he's seven home runs behind the league leader, Bryce Harper of the Nationals. But, I mean, this is the closest that any player in the National League has been in a long time to being at least an outside threat for a triple crown. Of course, Harper's right in that mix as well. He's third in the league in batting average, leads the league in home runs, and is fourth in the league and runs batted in. Well, it's also fun to watch a player who may be the best player on your team in the same position as the best player on the other team. So in this case, you have Joey Bottom and Paul Goldschmidt, and of course, Goldschmidt's having a a career year type year, an MVP type year, and Votto's as hot as a firecracker right now. So I, I always like the way those those players, same position, they kind of ratchet up their game just a little bit when another really superstar type player comes into town. I tell you, I don't know at this point how a voter is able to decide between Harper and Goldschmidt as to who will be the league's most valuable player. Now, time they weed that out. But it doesn't matter the category you look at. These guys are right there in every single one of them. Goldschmidt first in batting average. Harper third. Harper first in home runs. Goldschmidt fourth. Goldschmidt second in runs batted in. Harper fourth. Base hits. Goldschmidt leads the league. And a decent number of hits better than Harper. Goldschmidt third in the league in runs. Total bases. Harper first. Goldschmidt fourth. Slugging percentage Harper one Goldschmidt two on base percentage Harper one Goldschmidt two. I mean It just goes on and on and on and on There's a base hit in the left field by Suarez. He's had a nice day today two hits Well, the Reds have four and he has two it Seems like you say that an awful lot. He's had a nice day at the plate today. You're right. It's one of those situations, the shortstop position for the Reds, that you know when, when you take the, the the macro view of it, and it doesn't matter what sport. One of the beliefs in sports, Chris, has always been you should never lose your job because you were injured. Now we know that Zach Cozart was a solid player on offense and defense his first two years in the big leagues with the Reds before he just had a terrible offensive season last year. The defense was still great. There's a second out of the inning. He starts off this year and he's off to the best start of any season in his major league career by far. Mm -hmm. Then he has a terrible knee injury out for the year ACL reconstructive surgery and up comes a Eugenio Suarez a young man. That the only reason that he's a Cincinnati Red is because they were guarding against Cozart having another bad year and at least creating some competition in the shortstop position as Yvonne de Jesus Jr. will come up and bat now for Villarreal. So Suarez gets a chance to play. 
his numbers outside of the home runs. He's 10 games short of the number played by Kozai. Suarez has a much better batting average. The RBIs are going to be a wash. The doubles, triples, they're going to be a wash. Cozart's defense is far better. There's no doubt about that. Suarez is much younger. And, and while this season Cozart has more home runs, if I'm a betting man, and Chris, I think you would agree with this, if I'm a betting man moving forward, I'm betting Suarez hits more balls in the seats as their careers move forward. But Brian Price came out last week when Cozart rejoined the team and made the comment that the shortstop position belongs to Zach Cozart looking ahead to 2016. And nobody here is sitting around debating that or disputing that. But if you're Suarez, how do you think you look at that? Well, what you look at it is say, you know what, I'm going to change his mind. I'm going to play even harder than in the second part of my half here than I did when I first came over here and took over for the injured Cozart. And I'm going to show them that I ought to be the number one shortstop. It could be that, you know, it's just a, a nice psychological way of, of wording that answer for Brian Price. Oh, it works out like that. Mm -hmm. Reds leave a man. We go to the eighth, three nothing, St. Louis. Nothing as we move on to the eighth inning here at Great American Ballpark. Rain is finally letting up. It's probably the lightest it's been falling all game, but we entered today just shy of 24 hours worth of rain delays this season, and we are now past the official one day mark of total rain delay time. 19th rain delay today, now 24 hours and 40 minutes. 13 of those rain delays have been right here at Great American Ballpark, counting for more than 18 hours. Four postponed games and one suspended game. And I got to tell you, with all the forecast for today, the fact that we are in the eighth inning right now and the rain is letting up and it looks like, barring anything unforeseen, they'll get this game in in its entirety. Kind of a blessing to today. They got it in, even though they've had to play through really trying circumstances. Well, I hope you didn't just throw the kibosh on this one today. We do still have two innings left to go. Or better yet, maybe only an inning and a half. How does that sound? Well, that would be helpful if Dylan Ask Axelrod, who's the new Reds pitcher, would put a zero on the board. Been a nice job by the relievers so far in relief of Michael Lorenzen, who went five innings of three run baseball. Baden Hop, a one, two, three inning. Scoreless inning for Pedro Villarreal. And now Axelrod, who was hung with the loss last night after giving up a home run in his one inning of work. Ed Richard got him in the top half of the 13th inning with one out. Richard Wong Moss. 
It's only three nothing, but for some reason it just feels like a wider margin than that. It's not like that the Cardinals have just you know out slugged them here. It's nothing like that. Cardinals only have five hits. Reds have four, but the Reds have just posed virtually no threat at all today against Walker. They had a runner at second with one out in the first inning. They got a two out single by Phillips in the third. They had a leadoff walk to Votto, but then Walker retired three in a row in the fourth. Leadoff single in the fifth, but then bottom part of the batting order. Fielder's choice strikeout against the pitcher and a fly ball. And Axelrod delivers. Popped up. And this is playable, we think. Mervato screaming off Tucker Barnhart. Joey makes a catch. One out. Spun up there at 70 miles per hour by Axelrod and grounded right at Phillips off the bat of Colton Wall. Brandon Moss, who has walked, struck out, and bounced out to first base. And Axelrod starts him blowing away for ball one. Reds will have a top of the order in the bottom of the eighth inning. Will it be Waka? Why wouldn't it be Waka? If you're Mike Matheny, this will be the final out of the inning. So we'll find out when we come back. Phillips, Bourgeois, Votto to start it. Reds only down by three. The data strong fan photo of the game. Tweet your strongest fan photo to hashtag Ohio Data Strong Fan. And perhaps we'll show your picture. Brought to you by T Mobile. But it's a good one. Guys fired up. Scott, thank you very much. Well, we asked a question going to break. Would we see Michael Watkin, who goes seven innings and barely breaks a sweat? Four hits, no runs. 
He walked two and fans six, and he will give way to the man they brought in to, to pitch in these kinds of games, not only for the rest of this regular season, but the Cardinals are hoping in the postseason, and that's a one-time red Jonathan Broxton. Well, those are the season numbers on Broxton, but he has pitched against the Reds three times, uh, or pitched for the Cardinals, that is, since they acquired him three times since the trade from the Milwaukee Brewers. Pitching last night's ball game. Peter Borges takes over in center field. Day is over for Randall Britchick. Brandon Phillips to lead things off. One for three in the game. And it's ball one to Brandon. Bouchois to follow, then Votto, and the Reds are hoping for more than that. Down by three here in the last of the eighth inning. Three runs, five hits, six left on base for St. Lou. No runs, four hits, six left for the Red Legs. 2 0. Oh. Since Phillips is locked up with Broxton as far as you know any sort of length of time after being his teammate for a couple of seasons. Well, foul. Well, Broxton was one of the best teammates the Reds have had recently. I mean, he's a quiet guy, very soft spoken Georgia native, lives in Augusta, Georgia. But, I mean, he was just solid. I mean, he was there for you whenever you needed him. Just a good solid guy in a clubhouse that has played on some pretty good teams before. Mm -hmm. Once the full time closer for the Dodgers until he injured his arm. Selected for the All Star game, I think in 2008, perhaps, maybe it was 2009, was unable to perform because he had an elbow problem at the time that he was selected. You know, when they first brought him up, Jim Tracy was a manager out there with the Dodgers, Cincinnati native, and you know, the Dodgers were running through a whole pipeline of, of young, hard-throwing right-handers in their bullpen. And, and, and seemingly what they would do is, is they would rotate them, just continue to move them up the ladder. So, you know, Broxton would, would be that six-inning guy. And then about halfway through the year, they made him a seventh-inning guy. Then the following year, they made him the eighth-inning guy in front of Eric Gagne, boy, what, what a run he had before he was injured. And then when Gagne was finally out and on the shelf following so many arm problems, Broxton then became the closer of the Dodgers. He got hurt a few years later, earned his way back to closer status with the Kansas City Royals before the Reds brought him over, and he went back to being a setup man in front of Chapman. It was the Reds' closer. After Chapman was hit by the line drive in spring training by Salvador Perez, and then went back to the setup man after Chapman, of course, returned. Hard hit ball, but right at the shortstop, Garcia won away. Only have five outs to play with, and they're down by three. You know, being from Augusta, Georgia, or right around there, I mean, I think he was actually from Waynesboro, Georgia. They were born in Augusta, lives in Waynesboro now, but he's an avid golfer too when he's not during the middle of the baseball season. You ever teed him up with Jonathan Broxton? I did, as a matter of fact, when he was a member of the Reds. We, I remember one day we played it in Milwaukee, and you're not going to believe this. And I, and I had a pretty good drive, you know. For, and he what does hit, that mean? I mean, well, what does I mean, that mean? I had a drive. We measured it off and went 260. Okay, that's a good drive. We measured his drive off 100 yards by me on a fly. That's 360 yards. 
Is that what 260 plus 100 yeah. is? <laughs> you. Well, you were getting pretty good at math earlier. I thought maybe you warned yourself out. I mean, I had never seen anything like it in my That's entire life. And I played in some of these charity tournaments, you know, where they have a long drive champion and so on. Never have I heard the club speed or a, a club head go through the air the way that Broxton's driver does. It, it's just remarkable. So we've got something to fall back on. There's ball for it. So you're telling me he hits it further than our boy Jimmy V? He hits a six iron farther than Jimmy V's drive. I, I'm not kidding you. It's the, he hits a 360 on a fly. That's unbelievable. That's unbelievable. 360. Well, look at him. Mark Grace used to call him the biggest man in the world. <laughs> well, didn't they have a picture? When he went, it was Trey. When he signed that deal with the Kansas City Royals, and they they wanted to get his size and everything like that, and they had a couple of the clubhouse kids climb into his pants. There were two of them, right, standing in his pants. He's just a large human being and a, as good a teammate as you can get, and a great guy. Strike on Joey Votto has been on base all three plate appearances today. A double, a walk, and another walk. Bourgeois board, Reds down three, one out, and we're in the eighth. This game has more of a an April or May feel to it than it certainly does in the month of August. Cool temperatures in the 60s when we got started. We look around the stands and boy this time of year it is so rare to see people hanging out in coats and I mean legitimate coats. And we had we had the, the fans blowing in the, the booth two days ago. Pullovers, hoodies, got it all here today. 2 1 pitch. 2 and 2. Big league lid right there on the right. Wonder if we could bar that and take it with us to Arizona. Block out some of that hot sunshine out there in the desert. You'd look good in that. I would. That would be a very, very good look. You know, look good in that in the desert is Jim Day. You know what I mean? I mean, you know, slightly fair, fair of skin, and uh, and out there in, the, in Arizona, you have to be so careful. You do uh, everywhere. Three-two pitch. And there's ball four. So now the Reds are going to bring the tying one to the plate on consecutive walks given up by Broxton with a three-run lead. It's the ninth game of the season, and Vado has reached base four times. Seven of the nine. He's walked three times in a game. I mean, it's really unbelievable. I mean, today, you might as well have just looked at bottle like they do in high school rules and point to first base like you do the intentional walk because it doesn't look like any of these Cardinal pitchers after that double in the first inning really wanted to throw to him at all. Walk a walk in twice and now Broxton. Straight away center field. Did Frazier get enough of this? He did not. At the warning track, it'll be caught. Maybe on a hot day, that has enough. Hot, humid day. But not on this very cool, humid, free, rainy Thursday. That's the hardest he's hit the ball in a while. 
Well, he's going after the first pitch he sees, and Broxton kind of lays it right there for him. And you can see Broxton's reaction is, uh oh. He's holding his breath. Frazier probably knows at the time he hits it that it'll just come up short. Well, it's going to be all for Broxton. He'll leave two thirds, no hits, two walks. And I would imagine we did not see Randy Choate last night. Let's see who's coming out of that bullpen, and that is Randy Choate. He was the only reliever that wasn't used by the Cardinals last night. This will be our Skyline Chili call to the bullpen. We're back in a moment. Reds have a tying run at the plate. Jay Bruce about it. Sitting on 17 home runs this year and on to face him. A left-hander been around seemingly forever is Randy Choate. Well, Choate is on the last year of a three-year deal that'll pay him overall 7.5 million. Not bad at all for a situational left-hander that pitches in way more games than he does innings. Only 22 innings so far this year for Choate. Sidewinder on air strike. Everything he throws is going to be a breaking ball. I mean, the matter, the difference is, will it go down or will it go side to side, and what the speed is. High fly ball down the right field line, foul. You know, one of the reasons why a guy like Choate is so effective is that. Hitters never, and I mean never, take batting practice off of somebody who throws like this. So they never see a sidewinding left-hander that's throwing slop up there until the game is on the line. Which leads you to think, well, why not? Bruce, two hits and 13 career at-bats against Randy Cho. Cho has struck him out eight of the 13 times. Make it nine out of 14. We go to the ninth. Cardinals lead three nothing.
Well, let's go back to the second inning of this ball game. Michael Lorenz and on the mound. Randall Grinchick at the plate. And it is our flamethrower strikeout brought to you by Cholula Hot Sauce. One of two strikeouts. Think of three strikeouts that Lorenzen had against Grichik. The Reds are on the short side of the scoreboard down by three. Trevor Rosenthal tries, starts to throw in the Cardinal bullpen. Dylan Axelrod had a 1 2 3 eighth inning. And he will face Tony Cruz to start the St. Louis ninth. Three runs, five hits for St. Louis. No runs, four hits for the Reds. Final game at his homestand. Reds split four with the Pittsburgh Pirates. And they are 1 1 in this series with the Cardinals. So down three in the ninth. Trip up coming for Brian Price's team. It begins tomorrow night where Brian Price calls his home in the desert of Phoenix, Arizona. Price has lived there for many, many years. After growing up in Northern California, and then of course short time in the in the minor leagues as a professional pitcher himself, bouncing around a little bit in the minor leagues as a pitching coach. And then once he established himself as a big league pitching coach, he made his full time home in Arizona. But a three game series starts tomorrow night in Phoenix, will be a chase field. And again, uh, you know, a lot of times when the Reds go out west, and while that's not the West Coast, that's certainly the West. But the Diamondbacks start times are different dramatically different than most other teams out west even though in the summer months they're on the same time differential three hours behind Cincinnati Eastern time pulled on the ground of course Arizona is one of those states that does not change its clock over the course of the year so half the year there are three hours Behind Cincinnati and during the winter months are two hours behind. Reds live gets underway at nine o'clock tomorrow night. Nine thirty our game coverage begins. Saturday. Seven. Thirty. Eastern. Will be Reds live. Our game coverage starts at eight. Although the game is starting considerably later than that, due to the pre-game ceremony, where the Arizona Diamondbacks franchise will retire the number 50 worn, worn by their Hall of Fame pitcher Randy Johnson, and then 3:30 is the start time for Reds live on Sunday afternoon. Our game coverage starts at four. On from there. Three games in San Diego's Petco Park. Then next Thursday, a week from today, the first of four at Dodger Stadium in Los Angeles. With that four and a half hour car ride, four hour car ride, the difference in weather between the first two stops on this upcoming road trip. Yeah. Well, you said the Phoenix is going to have a little cool front come through. 107. Yeah. Well, that is cool. 10 degrees 
cooler than it was yesterday. Three and two to count. There's strike three called to Borges to the inning is over. Good work today by Axelrod after giving up the home run last night. Two perfect innings today. One more crack at him. Reds down 3-0. Ohio brought to you by Menards. Save big money at Menards on all your home improvement needs. And by your local Toyota dealers, proud sponsor of the Cincinnati Reds. Speaking of the Reds, when they come back to town, why not join us? The Arizona Diamondbacks will be here that weekend, August 20th through the 23rd. And thanks to Reach Savings Magazine, you can catch the action and save with the four for $48 ticket offer. $48, you get four view level seats. Plus four exclusive Reds hats. Call 513-381-REDS or visit reds.com slash 4448. Trevor Rosenthal has only blown two saves the entire year. Both of them against the Pittsburgh Pirates. 31 of 33. One pitch off his fingertips and this will be an infield hit for Marlon Bird. Another has need one more base runner. They'll bring the tying one to the plate. The Rosenthal falls a little bit off towards first base, and you see that ball just right over the mound. And the only way he could even think about getting it was barehanding it. Saw Rosenthal for an inning and a third here last night. He allowed only one base runner, and that was a two out walk in the 10th inning to Ryan Pena. He retired the batter he faces now, Suarez, on a ground ball to second base last night. One ball, one strike. It got pretty good results out of Rosenthal given the fact that he was a 21st round draft pick in 2009. A lot of other teams had an opportunity. Fly ball angling towards right, one away. Cardinals have thrown 10 shutouts this year. The Reds have been shut out seven times. was first scouted by the Cardinals. He was the shortstop at a junior college, Cowley County Community College in Arkansas City, Kansas. And he had just started pitching. So when he signed, they said no more 
are you going to be a shortstop? You're going to be a starting pitcher. That's what they groomed him as in the minor leagues. And they have changed that and directed him out to the bullpen. And he's been pretty awfully good since. Of course, there was a point in time last year where he hit a real bump in the road, and a lot of the Cardinal fans were ready to run him out of town. Well, the Cardinals have done it over the last five years or so with a whole mixed bag of relievers. I mean Rosenthal has been there for the most part but there was a time a few years ago I think they had eight different pitchers right. on their team record a save in one year and that was a championship year for the Cardinals. And that was a year I think it was when uh, Jason Mott went down with an injury. I mean, they had guys all kinds of guys closing games that year. Hey, this guy's done a superb job. Just a superb job. Mm -hmm. I mean, I look. I, I mean, I'm sure they're, they're trying to be the guy to replace Sparky Anderson here in Cincinnati. Had to be, you know, a very difficult task. Of course, that fell on the shoulders, if I'm not mistaken, of John McNamara. Um, you know, you go right down the list of great managers. Tommy Lasorda with the Dodgers, and, and going way back there, have been many, many, many others. I'm not sure you could say there was a harder act to follow. Not only in terms of wins and losses, but in terms of toughness, mental toughness, uh, the attitude that Tony La Russa brought to every single inning of every single game, the presence of La Russa. Um, some would say was a dominant, domineering. Um, some would say too much. But it could not be denied that when he left, to go out and bring in a guy who had zero, zero managerial experience in Mike Matheny. It was certainly a gamble made by John Mosellock, and it looks like he hit the lottery with that hire. Because they have a lot of talent in St. Louis. But when you go back and you start saying, okay, but let's look at all those young guys. His first year they brought to the major leagues or his second year all those young pitchers Manus Martinez Segrist Waka well the easy thing to do is say well yeah they all throw 98 miles an hour well again we're watching a lot of young pitchers for the Reds some of them are throwing 95 and it hadn't been an easy road to hoe so far for every one of them. There's a walk that will bring the tying run to the plate. Oh, you have Pena batting four Axelrod who works two perfect innings. Then you have Brandon Phillips. So let's see what Pena can do off the Reds bench. Down a strike. You know, I don't think Pena, and there's the numbers on Brian, and you see the, the zero in the home run column. He's not thinking about home run here. That would tie the game up, but you know, he knows that that's not his game. His game right now is just to keep the inning going, keep the line moving. Looks like he's just trying to guide that ball on the left field. Similar to his second double last night. of the ninth. Marlon Bird at second reached on an infield hit. Tucker Barnhart draws a one out walk. 
Rosenthal gets a sign from Cruz, and here comes the 2 2. Bounces up there. Full count on Pena. a Fosh type of a changeup. It's a little bit of a splitter, but instead of holding it between your index finger and your middle finger, you hit it hold between your ring finger and your middle finger. Has the same action. Really doesn't matter how you hold those changeups as long as you keep your fingers on top of the ball and pronate a little bit early, you get downward break. Seven home runs for Brandon Phillips. Reds down to their final out, but Phillips is a potential tying run. And a fastball in the outside corner at 97, strike one. That fellow down there hanging out by himself, enjoying the ball game. Line drive is hitting the stands, and ricochets right over to him. There he is. Made the catch, and now little kids are coming over and saying, hey, hey, come on now. Let's give it up. He said, turn around, son. Beat it. There's a fly ball in the right field. This will do it. Reds are shut out on five base hits. Cardinals, after losing the series opener, win the final two. Three-nothing, our final score. Walk of the winner, 13 and 4. Lorenz in a loser, 3 and 7. Rosenthal, his 32nd save. Off to Arizona. We'll look forward to seeing you again tomorrow night. Reds Live coming up next.